Revelation chapter 2. You ever look at your Bible and want to pinch it and move the... (laughs) All right, Revelation 2, um, 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who do not know the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Father, thank you, and uh, we have ears, but we still want your help in hearing and understanding and believing what your word here says to us, what we're to do about it, what we're to believe in light of it. Uh, Help us, Lord, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, someone said this uh, a long time ago. I don't remember where I heard it the first time, but... I just feel led to share it before we jump in. This is a heavy passage. It's uh, pretty intense. It's pretty, uh, uh, well, a lot of the Bible's challenging to understand. Um, The best way to make sure that you understand what the Bible says, the very first thing that you can do, is uh, to make sure that you're uh, one of the recipients of the Bible. This is written to Christians. This is written to people who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that they trust him as Savior. And to read it without knowing the Lord as your, uh, knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior would be similar to like reading someone else's mail. You might get some of it, but a lot of it's just not going to make sense to you. And so if you want to know, it, why not just start right now? I don't know all of you. I know most of you. But I don't know all of you. But if you want to know what, what we're talking about here, because when, when you become a believer, one of the things that happens is the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, and he's our teacher. And he illuminates our minds. He gives us understanding. He helps us understand what this is. It becomes mail to us. It becomes a letter to us. So um, if you don't know the Lord yet, trust Jesus. He'll save you from all your sins. He promises eternal life. He says he'll be with you always till the end of the va- till the end of the age. That not that everything will go smoothly, but he'll be with you through everything. And so, uh, just wanted to say that now. We don't always say it at the beginning. Let's say it at the beginning. Trust Jesus. Just tell him, I'm a sinner. I want you to be my. Savior. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I want to be yours. I want to be right with God. And and so, uh, you can do that right now. And the difference between what you'll understand will change. It really will. From the moment that you receive the Lord, it it will change. I don't know. I can't tell you the details of how it was, but you'll have an illumination to it that you won't have if you haven't done that yet. All right. 
So this is uh, the, the, the next of the seven churches, and this church was kind of a tolerant church. A, a, they were tolerant of idolatry and carnality. Um, some would label this a corrupt church. They weren't corrupt in every way that you could be corrupt. If they were, they wouldn't be a church, um, and the Lord probably wouldn't have wrote them anything, sent them a letter at all. But, and we'll see that they weren't corrupt in everything, but they definitely had corruption. And, the, you know, the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't take a lot to, you know, poison things. And there's plenty of leaven in this church. And so we don't ever want to be a corrupt church. We don't ever want to be corrupt believers. And so we want to heed this, this uh, message to this church in order to kind of alert us of any corruption that might have already crept into our hearts, our minds, our lives and also to just keep us on the alert to watch out for it creeping in us. And so uh, the first thing to point out is that the people of God are able to grow in good works more and more wherever we are. We can grow in good works more and more wherever we are. It says in verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write. So, as, of course, these are seven letters to seven different churches in seven different cities. And Thyatira was probably the least significant of the seven cities in, in these churches. It wasn't as populous as the others. It wasn't as affluent as the others. Probably one of the most significant traits of this city was the prominence of trade guilds. Uh, you know, we might call them workers' unions today. Uh, they were strong in Thyatira. And so Thyatira would be more like a blue-collar city than maybe some of the other cities that, we've, that uh, had churches in them. And uh, now the trade guilds, a trade guild, a union, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, but the ones in Thyatira and the ones at that time were also closely connected to uh, false religion, to idolatry. Uh, at that time, every trade guild had a, a, a patron god. And it was more than just a, something that they put on their logo. You know, this was something that was believed to be the helper of the people who practiced the trade and the one who blessed the workers and made them good at it. And so they would look to this. They, they, they thought of it in a spiritual way. The, at the meetings and the gatherings that they'd have, the patron God would be uh, recognized and prayed to and, and called upon and honored. And they would do it through worship, through sacrifice and They'd eat meat, sacrifice to the god of the trade guild. And then, of course, so much of the false religion of the time had uh, sexual practices uh, surrounding the worship of them. And so um, that's what it was like then. Uh, it's not uncommon today for uh, a union, you know, to, um, okay, they want to help their workers and that. But then they also do other stuff, right? They also get involved politically with things and and a lot of times the, the political bent of uh, a union will, be, will have some perspectives that are unbiblical and ungodly. And so, but a lot of times politics becomes a, prior high, prior, a higher priority than, than godliness. And so Thyatira had a lot of idolatry, even among just the regular people, even among the working class, a lot of false worship, a lot of sexual sin. And yet, just as with the other churches, there was a, a group of believers living in this place. And, and they had a particular challenge because of that. Because, because of the prominence of this and so much of it going on, either your choices were try to find a job that wasn't steeped in that. You know, go try to find a job where that wasn't so much of a big deal. And that would be hard to do. It'd be hard to find a job like that. A non-guild job you know, a non-union kind of job. They had to do that. Or join it, but do your best to resist the allurements and the pressures and the temptation and the practice that was involved with it. Either way, the Christians in Thyatira faced difficult challenges and a lot of temptations. <clears throat> and so that's, that's where this church was. And this church, just like um, Ephesus and Smyrna, had some commendable things in it and some bad things in it. So it says, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, 
and your patience. I thought I had a water. Can somebody give me a water, please? <laughs> um, uh, and your, as for your works, the last are more than the first. So first, the greeting to them. Um, the Son of God is speaking to you. Thank you. <clears throat> the one whose eyes search all things. The one whose feet stand strong in judgment. He has something to say to you. And he says, I know a lot about your situation. I know a lot about what's going on in your church. I know your works. And again, he says that to all the churches. I know your works. And this was a church that had a lot of works going on, and a lot of works were going on in good ways. They, this was a church that did works with love. There was service going on. It wasn't just works unto themselves. They were serving, helping others, that kind of thing. This was a church with faith and patience. They had patience with each other. They had patience with those outside. They were, they were patient. And, and then the Lord says that they were even increasing in good works. The, the good things they weren't doing, or the good things they were doing weren't just in the past. It wasn't just, you know, that, you know, they started out strong and then got kind of lazy. It says that your works, the last, are more than the first. You're, you're increasing. And so this church uh, had some good things going on. Now, the church definitely had corruption in it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the Lord still wanted to commend them. And we've seen that multiple times, and we're going to see it again in the next three churches as well, that, that uh, when there's something good going on, the Lord wants to let his people know about it. And so he told them, I know, I know about this in your fellowship. I like that, especially in light of this church, because this is one of the worst churches listed here in terms of like what's going on with them and how bad they had gotten. But that it shows us that the Lord isn't just like uh, searching for problems and that's all. It's not like the Lord's whole goal is to just find, you know, everything wrong. And that's all he cares about. And that's all he's doing. You know, he's not just looking for uh, everything that's off in, in order to constantly correct. When there's good and he sees it, he wants to commend us for it, and we should remember that. And, and the reason why we should remember that is because sometimes people can go to extremes on this. There's, there's those who can only see one or the other. There's some people that only see bad things. They, they couldn't or wouldn't commend or bless or encourage somebody for something good to save their life. There's people like that. They just, nothing is good. If they open their mouth, it's going to be correction What's wrong with you? I can't believe this. And that's all they do. And then there's other people who are the opposite. Nothing's bad. There's nothing bad. Oh, you're cheating on your wife? Oh, man, praise the Lord that you're still married. You know, like, there's nothing bad. There's, they wouldn't dare call out sin. Oh, man, that, that's the nicest looking lipstick on a pig I've ever seen. You know, that kind of stuff. And, and the Lord isn't like that with his church. The Lord is balanced. He says the truth to us, good or bad. And, and we as his people need to be balanced that way too. We need to have that. We need to be open to receiving it for ourselves as well. Most of the time, not everything is bad. And, and uh, not everything is good either. It's like a, a baseball player a pitcher in baseball. He throws balls and he throws strikes. Is he trying to throw all strikes? Of course he is. I mean, he wants to strike somebody out. He wants to either throw a strike or something that's going to get swung out and be a strike that way. But, but that doesn't always happen. Although, actually, recently there was a guy that threw his second immaculate inning from the Mets. An immaculate inning is when you strike out three batters in a row in nine pitches. It's immaculate. It's crazy. Like, I, I read, I looked it up. There's only been 103 recorded since 1889. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of innings pitched since then. So it's a pretty rare thing. But, but and it, it, you know, that in, as it relates to our lives, as it relates to the church, we throw, you know, there's balls, there's strikes, and the Lord calls them true. And, um, and, and as we pointed out in our four others, and this is our fourth study in the churches, 
okay, there's good and there's bad, but we're still able to grow. We're still able to move forward. We're still able to to have the Holy Spirit work through our lives. And it doesn't matter where we are, blue collar, white collar. It doesn't matter if you're in the Bible belt or you live next to Satan's throne, as we looked at last time, that the people of God are able to do good things wherever we are, and we're able to do them in increasing measure. And he wants us to know that. So let's pray that we'll be like that. Let's pray that we'll be the kind of people that do good, recognize when it's wrong, correct it, and then grow in these things. The next thing to point out is that our goal is, shouldn't be to be as busy as possible, but to be as submitted to the Lord as possible. Verse 20 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual, sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So the rebuke to this church was a serious one, and it was about this woman uh, called Jezebel. Now, was that her real name? It might have been, but it probably wasn't. He was probably calling her a Jezebel-like woman. And, uh, but it, it could be that her name was actually Jezebel. But, but she was a terrible woman, a real problem. And, and if, if it's just that she's Jezebel-like, there's a reason for that. Jezebel was one of the most wicked people in the entire Bible. Uh, you can read about her in 1 Kings um, 18, 19, 20, and, and, uh, or 21 and 2 Kings 9. She was the daughter of a Sidonian king, uh, a pagan nation. She was a, a, a Baal worshiper. She married King Ahab of Israel, so he wasn't a wise or godly guy for doing that. And in that position, she led Israel to uh, a lot of Baal worship, and so much so that Baal worship took place in the temple. And so, and of course, Baal worship included sexual expressions, sexual sin. And so calling this woman of Thyatira in the church Jezebel is a serious, serious rebuke. Now, understand her being a woman is not or was not the issue at all. There were other prophetesses in the Bible. Uh, Miriam, Deborah, Isaiah's wife was called a prophetess. Philip's daughters in the New Testament, they were called prophetess. Prophet, I can't say it. You know what I'm saying. That's not the issue. It's not that she was a woman. The, the, the woman called herself a prophetess. That's what it says. She calls herself a prophetess. You see the distinction? She claimed the role. She, she named herself this. She gave herself this position, as it were. Uh, she called herself that. And the Lord called her something else, right? She called herself a prophetess. And the Lord called her Jezebel. And, and um, you know, it's not a good thing when a minister is a minister because they made themselves a minister. It's not a good thing when a minister is a minister because man made that person a minister. We, we want people to serve because God made them that. And, and when we take the title from anywhere other than from God... Uh, it becomes a bad thing. There's a lot of people in positions of ministry like that. There always have been. And, and, uh, you know, they might be dynamic. They they might have other qualities liked by the world, things that the world looks at and goes, wow, what a great, you know, minister or whatever. But they're not called by God, not his servant, and that's not a good thing. And that's what, that's like one of the things about this woman Jezebel. She wasn't in this position by the hand of God. She, put her, she got herself in there. And so this woman, like Jezebel of old, she taught really bad things to the people of God. She was infecting the church the way that Jezebel of old was, had infected Israel. And, and so here's what the Lord did. The Lord rebuked first the pastor for it. He rebuked the pastor for allowing it. This was worse than what happened in in uh, the previous church that we studied in, in Pergamos. 
there, you remember the pastor was told that there are people in your church who are believing in bad doctrines. And, and he needed to be aware of it so that he could address it. But here in Thyatira, the pastor knew what was going on, and he was allowing it to go on, and he was allowing this woman to preach it and teach it in the church. And we might wonder, why in the world would he do that? I mean, it's a real church. It's not hard to understand why a church that isn't really a Christian church, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, they've, they've gone so far off the mark. It's not hard to understand why they have, you know, uh, unbiblical teachings. We get that. But this is a real church. We know it is because the Lord has a message for them. So how does something like this happen? It doesn't tell us, but I can speculate. I, I kind of guessed as to it. There might be other reasons than this, but you can speculate on the mindset and the motive here. Here's a church with a lot going on, and they like to do a lot, a lot of activity. And, and, it's, and there's a lot of spiritual activity. And here's something else that can be presented as spiritual activity. It's under the guise of ministry. And it's carried out by somebody of note, someone who was seen to be gifted and dynamic and, you know, charismatic and is a prophetess. And that sounds really good. And, and here's, here's this busy and active church with all kinds of stuff going on, and, and they want to do more. What church wouldn't want to do more for the kingdom of God? Let's do all the ministry we can, right? And so maybe they already, they already had men's ministry. They already had women's ministry. They had children's ministry, youth ministry, College, young adults, they had singles, they had Spanish ministry, they had seniors ministry, they had couples ministry, they went on missions trips, maybe they had, a, they had a cafe and a bookstore and a radio station. <laughs> they even had an auto shop for, you know, uh, single moms to help them. These are all good things. It'd be great if a church could do all that kind of stuff. And so here they are, and they got all this ministry and, and I don't know, you just speculate. Somebody comes up with an idea. What about a ministry that caters to people that like to worship Baal along with Jesus? You know, we want to make them feel, you know, comfortable in church too. We want to minister to them too, right? And, 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 we, and there's a lady that, man, she's really good at this. She knows all about it. She's tops at the, you know, in the Baal worship. And, and so maybe, I don't know, maybe they just argued, hey, let's be a church that shows we care about people like that too. We even care about them. And, and uh, maybe, it, maybe it was tied to the trade guilds. There's so many people in, in the church that work for this trade guild. They have the, let's make them feel welcome too. Let's reach more of those guys. How? I don't know. Let's just make them... Show them that they can practice what they're doing out there here. And then, and then, you know, they'll get to hear about Jesus too. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Maybe that's how it happened. Whatever the case may be, it was happening in the church. And the Lord plainly says, what are you doing? No. I don't, that's not okay in the church. Church sanctioned sin? What are you thinking? I mean, let's have a church poker night too, and a and a an all a church happy hour on Saturdays, and let's have you know instead of Tupperware parties and pampered chef, let's now they do like weed exchanges and beer exchange parties. Let's do that at the church too. We want those people to feel welcome too, right? Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. He did, but he didn't join in in their sin. He influenced them out of it. He, and he never felt the need to cater to them and go, oh, yeah, you know, come into my kingdom, keep doing all that all you want. He loved everyone and, and said, don't sin like that anymore, though. Not all activity is good for a church. More isn't always better. It, it, it doesn't matter how you spin it. Some things are just plain wrong. And some things should be said no to. And some people should be said no to. Quantity is not more important than quality. 
the quality of godliness, the quality of righteousness is more important than a whole bunch of stuff going on. And we don't want more activity and less godliness. We don't want more dynamic teaching and less biblical teaching. teaching. We ought to be careful that our works are righteous and right more than they are, you know, plentiful. We, plentiful is not a problem. But it is when, when we, you know, go for plenty uh, at the expense of right. There's nothing wrong with a busy and active church. We want that. But we want everything we do to be submitted to God. We don't want to be, our goal is not to be as busy as possible. It's to be as godly and submitted to the Lord as possible. And then the next thing to, to look at here is we aren't given an unlimited amount of time to repent. We need to repent quickly. It says in verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Now, according to this verse, the Lord um, had, had, was aware of this for a while. He, I mean, the Lord's aware of everything from the minute it begins, right? But he, he and, and he, so he tells them that, he tells uh, this church that he wanted this woman to repent. He gave her time to do it. And the implication is, if the Lord wanted her to and gave her time to do it, that she knew, she knew that the Lord wanted her to. And that makes sense. Even if it wasn't like a direct rebuke or something like that, the, the people know when they're going wrong. We know when we're doing something wrong. We know, people know that sexual immorality is wrong. And so either they, you know, hide it, repent of it, or act like it's not wrong and do all they can to steer their conscience of it. But any sexual activity outside the marriage of a man and woman is sin. And it's sin for everybody, but it particularly the people of God ought to know, this isn't okay. My Lord doesn't want me to live this way. The Lord doesn't want his church to act this way. And, and so it shouldn't, as, as much as it's wrong for everyone, it absolutely should never be endorsed or approved or, you know, winked at in the church. And, and, and the Lord's faithful to bring conviction to his people. He, he gave his word to communicate his heart to his people. And, and the, you know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, of righteousness, of of judgment, and so a person knows. We know when we're getting off track, and and like the Lord did with this woman, He's gracious when that happens. He's patient. He gives us warning. He doesn't just squish us the second. You know, He doesn't just haul off and nail us with judgment the minute we step out of line. He's patient, and and. Uh, and the thing is, is that's the easiest way. It's the most simple thing in the world to repent. It's hard because we're selfish sinners, but it's simple. It's just turn away from it, confess it, turn back to the Lord, determine you're going to stop doing it, seek his help to stop doing it because sometimes it's pretty entrenched and it's hard to just break bad habits. But that's so simple. And God gives us all plenty of time, but it's not unlimited time. And, and we know how that works. If you're a parent at all or you've ever dealt with kids in any way, you know, we don't take pleasure in punishment. We don't enjoy the harsh discipline. It's so much better when we could just say it and they just correct. And, and so we warn and we give... Uh, opportunity to respond and and if they respond appropriately we're just glad that was easy but when they don't then you know harsher measures are taken and uh, we have to do something else and and God's like that that's how he is that's what's happening right now we're in this room we're opening up his word we're seeing what it says. We're seeking to understand it. And more than likely, 
somebody in here, at least one person probably, and somebody listening on the air or watching online has been convicted about something. What is that? That's God's gracious, kind warning. Repent. And you have time to do that. I don't know how much time, because I don't know how many times he's been telling you. And I don't know how much time he gives everyone. I don't think anyone could say it's just like this X amount of number for every single person. I, I, we don't know that. And because we don't know that, it doesn't tell us how long he gives us time to repent. It's, it, then the best bet is to just do it the second you know you need to. Just repent while you can. Repent like you don't have a moment to waste. Repent like when you realize you need to repent, like this is the last warning. Because maybe it is. I don't know. And, and, um, and so that we don't have an unlimited amount of time. And the next point is that after God's patience comes strong discipline, sometimes painful judgment. After patience comes strong discipline, sometimes painful judgment. It says in verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works." Now, in the previous church and in the one at Ephesus, the Lord said, repent or else. Remember that? He said it to two churches. For the, this woman in Thyatira, the time for all or else had passed and or else had, was upon her. And, and, you know, he doesn't say, repent or else. He says, I gave her time to repent. She didn't. And so here's what I will do now. God doesn't give empty threats. He means his warnings. And he says, I'll cast her into a sick bed. Um, maybe the idea here is thought to be that here's this woman. What's, what's the gist of her sin? Sexual immorality. Uh, a bed of sexual sin. And it's like the Lord is saying, I'm going to take her from that bed of fornication and I'm going to put her in a different bed, a bed of sickness, a bed of anguish, a bed of suffering. Maybe this was some sort of sexually transmitted disease. You know, if you, if you never have sex before until you get married and then once you get married and you marry somebody that does the same thing um, and you only have sex with each other for the rest of your life, you have virtually zero chance of getting a sexually transmitted disease. Pretty simple. So maybe, maybe that's what this is. Or, or maybe it's just going to be something the Lord does directly to her. We don't know for sure. One way or the other, this is a pronouncement of judgment for, on her. And then, not only her, but those involved in her sin. Notice, those who commit adultery with her. The, in, in the Bible, uh, idolatry is often likened to spiritual adultery. Um, and, he's, and so he's saying, yeah, there's big trouble for anyone else who's involved with her. But with them, they still have time. It says, and, and he's giving them one more chan- another chance unless they repent of their deeds. And then he not- notice he also mentions her children. And it's not clear if these are her actual physical children may be born because she's having, you know, so much uh, sex out there. Or if it's just speaking of her spiritual offspring, kind of her disciples that are on board with her. And this doesn't say either way that their judgment would be severe too. It says, I will, uh, the Lord says, I will kill her children with death. Sounds strange. Kind of sounds like I'm going to kill them to death. That's not what it means. It, the word death there means pestilence, disease. So the same route that she's going. Then he speaks of the purpose of this judgment. And, and there's, there's a purpose in it. When, and whenever God uh, disciplines or has to uh, 
lay out judgment, it usually has multiple layers of purpose in it. It's, it's never just simply punitive, you know. It's also, it always has correction in it as well and instruction in it too. And it's usually meant to go further than just to the person who's experiencing the judgment. And uh, he wants to instruct those that are receiving the discipline, they're in need of it, and anyone else who would watch and pay attention from it. And, and this, the judgment of this Jezebel and those involved with her was meant to give warning to the entire church, every church. It says that all the churches shall know. So here's what I'm going to do to her. Here's what I'm going to do to anyone who's involved with her that doesn't repent. Here's what I'm going to do to her kids. The, I'm, you know, there's going to be pain, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be sickness and disease. Why? That all the church shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll give to each one of you according to your works. And, and the Lord wants all his people to take note when judgment happens. To take note when judgment happens on sin. So that we'll have a healthy fear of the Lord and of sin. And, and people that don't have a healthy fear of the Lord end up getting in a lot of trouble with sin. And they end up experiencing a lot of harsh consequences that God doesn't really want to do. And, and so, um, he's, you know, he's not punishing anyone who didn't do this. He's not judging anyone who's not involved with it. It's not like, oh, I go to that church and we're all in trouble now. No. If you weren't involved, you're not, God's not going to deal with you, but you still should take note. And, and that could be you. You're a sinner just like them. You know, every time a pastor falls into sin and then is exposed because of it, it wasn't a one-time deal. It didn't just happen. The, the, there was time to repent. There was plenty of warnings that were given and ignored or blown past. And there was conviction for sure. And, and then time ran out. And so God dealt was de- God was already dealing with the person long before anybody else knew what was going on. And it's because they didn't repent. They didn't, you know, do what they needed to do that God goes, okay, well, I'm going to do something else. And not only is it going to be harsh on you, but you're going, you're going to be an object lesson. Because I want other people to beware of this. He, and so he does that. He loves his church too much to just ignore these kinds of things. And, and uh, the Bible says judgment begins in the household of God. And so don't forget it. After his patience come and warning comes strong, painful discipline. And then the next point I want to make is that if you're doing what's right, keep at it. And, and you don't need to feel unduly guilty. Just keep doing what's right if you already are. It says in verse 24, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. So now, even in the midst of this sinful church, and it's corrupt, and all this, this is bad stuff going on in this church, there were still those in the church of Thyatira that were living right. They were, they were living for the Lord. They weren't, they weren't involved in these things. And, and, he, and he, he mentions, they, these people, they didn't know the depths of Satan. And he commended them and encouraged them and, and, you know, keep up, keep at it. Good job. I'm glad you're doing that. That's all you need to do. You don't need to burden yourself with anything else. Part of that, I think he wants them to know, I don't want you, yes, I want you to see this as an object lesson, take it as a warning, beware of how you could fall like these people have fallen, but I don't want you to feel overly burdened like you're in trouble for something that you didn't do. I think that's part of it. But I think there's another another part of it too where he's saying, especially where he talks about uh, you have not known the depths of Satan. You haven't gone deep into sin like these people have. I think 
something that the Lord would say to us and would say to them through this is that, you know, sometimes there are those that like to argue that in order to reach people, you need to get involved with what they're involved with, you know, and you need to be well-versed in it, you know. They would say, you have to know the depths of Satan. How can you reach anybody who is involved with the depths of Satan if you aren't involved with the depths of Satan? You know, and even to the point where they might claim to be more spiritual for being like that. You know, if you're going to reach people who are uh, alcoholics, you gotta got to drink a lot. you got to show them you can drink, you know, you can hold your own too. And the, and the Lord would say to that, what a bunch of hogwash. He commends those who had nothing to do with this Jezebel and her sin. He commends them for staying clear of all that. The, Paul said in Romans 16, 19, be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. But there are some people that would say, oh, no, you've got to be wise in what's evil. You need to know all the expressions of evil. And you can't, how, could you, how could you possibly reach anybody if you're just you know, such a simpleton in those things and naive about those things? Jesus said in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, and therefore be as wise as servants, serpents and harmless as doves. But then there are those that would say, Man, we're going out among wolves. We need to become as wolf-like as we can. And, and the Lord says, No, you're not involved in that. You don't need to get involved in that. Just keep what you're doing. Hold fast till I come. Keep doing what you're doing. That's the main thing you need to concern yourself with. He wanted to encourage them that way. Go, go back to an example with kids. Somebody does something in the house. Something happens and, I don't know, some kid breaks something. But the parents aren't 100% sure who did it. Right? So, they gather. Let's say they have five kids. Just a random number on the top of my head. <laughs> And they gather them all in. Maybe we know, you three, I know you didn't do it. You weren't even here when it happened. You can go and keep not breaking things. Go ahead. One of you two is in trouble. Right? And that's kind of the idea here. It's like the Lord doesn't want, yes, we have to deal with the church. Yes, you need to know what's going on because... This is a bad thing in the church. Maybe be praying about it. Keep yourself clear of it. And now we'll deal with these guys. And so that's kind of what he's saying here. You know, hold, if, if you didn't do it, you don't need to feel burdened or guilty or bad about it. Just, just keep doing the good that you've been doing. Keep being faithful. Keep doing right. Don't do any of the stuff these guys are doing. And, uh, and again, those people that would say, oh, but you got to know about these things and you got to know about sin. You got to know what's, what it's all about and all that kind of stuff because we might appear naive or backward or dim-witted in worldliness. And so what? I'm happy that many wicked and godless things might go over my head. I'm glad. I'd be happy. If, I wish more did. I wish I didn't know some of the things I knew because of what I used to do before I came to the Lord. I'm happy to just be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm glad for more of that. It's good enough to just know. And, and I don't need to know all the, all the, and we don't need to know all the sordid details of sin. Because what we do know is that Jesus can save any sinner, no matter how sinful and wicked and steeped in it they are. And he loves all sinners. So what do I care about all the details of it? Just come to the Lord and be saved. Just be forgiven, be washed, be cleansed, be renewed. That's enough. That's more than enough. And, and so we hold fast. We just want to hold fast to that until he comes. And, and um, this is the first time among the churches that he starts talking about his coming. Um, and if he said it then, well, we're closer than ever now to his coming. And, and the idea then, because he says it in this context, is if everyone around you falls, if you end up going to a church where everybody is just crazy, whacked out in sin, first of all, go find another church. Second of all, you know, 
Just hold on, even if it gets more difficult, and just hold on to the Lord. And then the, the last uh, point here is that the reward is infinitely worth the struggle. I don't know if that's what I wanted to call this point. Maybe I'll call it something else after I teach it. Here, verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as with all the churches, there's a reward promised, kind of a motivation given. The one who overcomes is the one who, is, who, who lives through all this wickedness and, and never stops walking with the Lord. He says there's great reward for that person. And I probably already said this in a previous study, but before we comment more on these these verses, just the fact that that there is a reward for overcoming means that we can overcome. It would kind of be pointless for him to, to, to promise overcoming if you couldn't do it. And, and so he's saying you can. It's possible to be a strong Christian who doesn't quit, who doesn't fall away, who doesn't get caught up in all the stuff of the world. Um, it, no matter where you live, if it was possible in Thyatira, and it was, it, it's possible here. If it was possible for somebody to work in such a, a, an environment where the very people you work with, because they're involved in this trade guild, are so vile and sinful and foul, and yet they were able to be faithful unto the Lord, then it's possible for us to do that too. I'm pretty sure somebody around here works with people like that, right? I, I've always worked in construction, so I, I know how that goes. But I'm sure it's not just construction. I'm sure there's all kinds of lame stuff going on in offices too. But, but we can stand upright in the face of all that, around that kind of thing. And he tells them what the reward is, and there's two parts. He says, I get, I'll give him power over the nations, and I'll give him the morning star. So the power over the nations, that's a reference to the millennium, which we'll read about in uh, chapter 19 or 20. And uh, when Jesus comes and he reigns on the earth for a thousand years, and the, the Bible says that we're going to reign with him in, in that time. And he quotes Psalm uh, 2 here. That's what verse uh, 27 is, talking about that time. He, it's a reference to how the Lord's going to rule righteously and powerfully. This, this reference to potter's vessels. It, it's a reference to him being sovereign and having his way. But the Bible teaches that God is like a potter, and we're like clay in his hands. And, and what he wants to do and what he's seeking to do with us is to make us into the image of Jesus. We're, we're, a, we're a vessel in his hands like that. But a potter, if, is, if he's making something, and for some reason the, the pottery doesn't turn out to the liking of the potter, then the potter just throws it out and it dashes into pieces. And, and the idea is that when Jesus finally returns and he's finally ruling in this earth, there, there won't be this kind of stuff going on that was going on in Thyatira. There won't be churches with people teaching the stuff that Jezebel was teaching. There won't be churches where people say they're Christians but are involved in all manner of, you know, sin like that. He'll just throw the trash out. And there's a day coming when he's going to reign on the earth like that. And, and that we're told that as overcomers, we're going to enjoy that time. We're going to rule. We're going to be with him. That'll be our reward. And the idea is that, yes, it's hard now. It is. It's, it's hard to go to church when it's hard to just be a Christian when the world is constantly and ever increasingly and faster going towards hell. 
And it would be particularly difficult if you went to a church where, you know, all the, you know, all kinds of people in the church are like, yeah, just, we believe in Jesus, but we like to do this too. That's hard. And, he, and he, the reward for them and the encouragement and the motivation here is just hold on. It's not always going to be like that. And then he says, the other reward is, I'll give him the morning star. And this one's awesome, too, as a reward. This is a name for Jesus. The morning star is the, what's the morning star? It's the sun. It's the sunrise. It comes up in the morning. The brightest thing. And, and the return of Jesus is likened to the morning star. But he says, I'll give him the morning star. And so what he's saying is, I'll give you myself. I'm your reward. I love that. Uh, remember, God told that to Abraham. Abraham uh, fought that battle, and he won it, and he didn't take any of the spoils. And maybe he was second-guessing himself on that. Man, I, I gave up all those spoils from that battle. I, I mean, I rescued Lot. That was good, but I didn't take any of the spoils. And so the Lord comes and says, Abraham, I'm your reward. I'm your shield. I'm your exceedingly great reward. And that's what he's saying to us here now in this. That's what he's saying to this church. You have to, you know, when you live in an environment like they did in Thyatira or like we do now, there's a lot of things we have to, like, remove ourselves from. And it can feel like, you know, we're outcasts, we're missing out, whatever. And he, and he says, you're not missing out on anything. You have me. I'm yours, and I'll be yours forever. And, and how awesome that is. Do you think of Jesus as your reward? He's already yours. He already, he's already with you. He said he'll never leave you if you're a believer. But the reward gets greater because there's going to be a day when we see him face to face. We're going to be with him, and, and that's, that's the reward. That's the promise. Yet you'll... It'll be, it'll be more than worth it to resist these things. And then he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And again, that's to anyone. Can you hear what he's saying to you? Can you hear him? And if you can, just believe him, trust him. And if you, again, as we started out, if you've never received Jesus as Lord, receive him, trust him. He's calling you to save you, to forgive you, to renew you, to be with you. We have a communion on the first Sunday of the month.